you want to see his face. Hello, Hello everyone, and uh, welcome to Whole Financial Planning. And I am so fortunate today to have Mark Kohler, super CPA and attorney extraordinaire, uh, with me to talk about some tax uh, mistakes that investors and ordinary people make. Uh, he's the author of a book that I just recently read, and I'll let you tell him about it. Uh, but I am thrilled to have you on board, Mark. Why don't you uh, why don't you tell the whole financial planning community all about you? Jason, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's exciting. I uh, uh, love to talk about this topic. I know some of you may think that's pretty nerdy, uh, but uh, let me tell you, the number one cost in our lives right now are taxes. We're seeing a lot of uh, news and legislation on this, and we as entrepreneurs and investors uh, and just average Americans have got to take this more seriously and, and got to be aware of what's going on. So I, I, it's an honor to be here with you. Um, I'm a CPA, an attorney, that's right. I uh, partner in a law firm, an accounting firm. We help clients all over the country. And I uh, have a, two best-selling books. I have the first one's titled Lawyers or Liars. Now, if lawyers out there, don't be offended. Hang with me. It's Lawyers or Liars, the truth about protecting our assets. And I talk about all the scam artists out there that call lawyers liars and take advantage of investors and those of us trying to live the American dream. It's a fantastic book. And I quote the experts in what works in asset protection. And then my second book is titled, uh, what your CPA isn't telling you. Uh, and my publisher is Entrepreneur Magazine. They're, it's their number one best selling book the last two years. And it's all about tax planning. And it's a fictional story that makes tax planning fun and easy to learn. And uh, even if you're an, an uh, experienced in entrepreneur or investor or just getting started, there's tons of info in there that will rock your world. So that's me. I have a national radio show. I write on a regular basis for several columns and I have a blog. So anyway, just glad to be here, Jason. That's me. Live in Southern awesome. California. Uh, oh, yeah. Wife and four kids and I surf on the weekend. So there you go. Nice, nice. So uh, Doug Nordman's going to love you. Uh, he's, a, <laughs> he's a fellow blogger. Um, and, and I read that the, the book about CPAs, uh, what your CPA is telling you, and it is awesome. So uh, definitely heartily recommend that book. It, it, it'll rock your world. Um, so I want to get in. I, I know my readers have a ton of questions. I've got some uh, that I want to dig into. And uh, so, so one of the things that um, I talk about a lot is, is investing um, and you know, being smart with your investments. And, and one of the things that even though you don't want the tax tail to wag the dog, you do need to think about taxes when you're an investor. So, so what are some of the common mistakes from a tax perspective that the average investor makes? You bet. Well, a couple thoughts. And uh, I'm here in my little studio here in Southern California. So I might use a whiteboard here. We'll see. Uh, so uh, we'll just play that by ear. Um, the first thing is, is, gosh, there's so much out there that I talk about for the average uh, middle income tax paying American that they should be thinking about when it comes to tax planning. But some of the mistakes, and I just want to rattle these off, and I know that there's a lot of people listening on Google chat right now, so they may ask a question further. Uh, but some of the it, when I first hear the word investor, I think of really two different branches. You might be looking at traditional investing per se in Wall Street, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and then you're going to have the other group of investors out there that are doing real estate or uh, small business, and they're looking for you know different tax results in that process. Now, the the key point I want to make here is that if you're uh, doing any sort of investing. One of the key mistakes a lot of clients make is not using a self-directed retirement account, which I know we're going to talk about in a minute. But that's a key issue, very, very important when it comes to investing. The second thing is, is this year, as you make investment income, we need to worry about Obamacare. We have a net investment income tax now on your net investment income. And so there's certain types of investment income that's going to get subject to this new 3.8% tax and there's certain investment income that's not. Now I'm blogging on this a lot and you're going to want to follow me. Uh, later you'll see how to get in touch with me if you want and stay in touch on my newsletter. But this that's something that's going to be an ongoing issue as we figure out better to help our investors work around Obamacare. Um, the third mistake is a lot of times people uh, get blindsided with self-employment tax. Even as an investor, there's times when you can get subject to self-employment tax in investments. And this is, you know, a little scary out there when you're investing in all these different businesses and projects. You need to be very attuned as to what you're getting into. Now, again, of course, if you're doing stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, you're looking at short-term capital gain or long-term capital gain every time. Uh, 
But when you start getting out of that world and start doing uh, smaller uh, you know, types of private equities or uh, securities or private placements in real estate, you got to be careful. So it's uh, it's exciting. But those are some common mistakes, Jason, where people just aren't thinking ahead as to what taxes we're now facing. And one more thing, Jason, I've got to say this: with Obamacare, I'm mean, sorry, with President Obama, to be, with all due respect to there, is uh, with the ATRA, the American Tax Relief Act that was passed three weeks ago, early January. You know, the news flash was, oh, if you're making 400 grand, you're going to get a higher tax rate. They forgot to mention that those folks making 200 to $400,000 are going to feel a major tax hit as well. Pr exemptions are phasing down, uh, itemized deductions are phasing down, we have Obamacare kicking in at 200 to 250, we have AMT patch that was placed in there but it's still going to hit people at 2 to, two, two to 400. So my point here is folks, if you're making 200 grand or more, which some people would say that's rich, I don't know, in a lot of markets today you're still trying to hold it together at 200 grand. Um, you're going to be paying a bigger tax bill. And so it's very, very important that you're taking an active approach with the planning with your CPA. And, and Mark, you brought up a couple of things with that answer that, that I want to dig into. So the first one is, is you mentioned self-directed IRAs. And you know I, I see a lot of stuff about, oh, go do a self-directed IRA, and, and then it winds up being just this big, hairy ball of mess. So help, me, help dispel some of these myths about a self-directed IRA. Where's it good and where's it not good? You bet. Now, this is exciting. And folks, if you've heard about self-directed IRAs, just sit back, put your guard down, check this out. Folks, when we were in the, listening to the presidential campaigns this last fall, and people were shocked to hear that uh, Mitt Romney had a $20 million IRA. That blew people away. How did, how did he get $20 million in his IRA? Folks, he had the same rule as you and me, that he could only put $5,000, $5,500, $4,500, whatever the rule was back 10 years ago, too. He was putting the regular annual contributions in his IRA, just like you and me. But what he did is he self-directed that IRA. So when he was at Bain Capital doing his uh, hostile takeovers and rehabs of businesses, rather than rehabs of real estate, he was rehabbing businesses, he did it inside his IRA. I call it opportunity shifting. Instead of always making money in your own name, to avoid the myriad of taxes out there, start shifting some of those opportunities to your IRA or 401k. Now this has been around for 30 years, but Wall Street, this is the secret they don't want you to know. The average stockbroker has no incentive whatsoever to tell you to self-direct your IRA. Now of course Schwab says, oh we have a self-directed IRA online. That's so you can self-direct and day trade all day long. A true self-directed IRA or 401k allows you to move your money to a custodian, like all the big ones out there, the Penscos, the Entrust, the American Pensions, the U-Directs, the, uh, they're all over the place. There's, there, there's 20 to 30 and there's more cropping up every day. They've been around for 30 years. They just can't compete for Super Bowl commercial time like Merrill Lynch. But folks, it's very, very simple. So you find a custodian, open an account, might cost you 45, 50 bucks, and you roll a portion of, I'm not saying take all your IRA or 401k and risk it all in a private equity deal or real estate deal, but move that money out of some of it, out of your traditional IRA or 401k into a self-directed format. It could be a Roth, it could be a SEP, a Simple, an HSA, any of those. Move it into a self-directed custodian and on day two they call you up and go, what do you want to invest in? There's some annual fees that you have to be aware of, oftentimes very much uh, cheaper than a traditional stockbroker. And you can invest in LLCs, you can invest in private placements, you can invest directly in real estate. And for the last 12 years, we've been helping clients do it and provide comfort letters to help you avoid the scams and the pitfalls. Folks, it doesn't have to cost, last point, Jason, it does not have to cost thousands of dollars. There's yahoos out there charging $3,000, $5,000 to set up your self-directed IRA in a checkbook LLC. Folks, it does not need to cost that much. We're at maximum $1,500 helping clients all over the country do this and they're in business within a week, running their IRA out of a checkbook LLC, doing deals, and we're standing behind you that you're not going to have prohibited transaction problems with the IRS. It's exciting, Jason, and that's how you too can have a $20 million IRA like Mitt Romney. And Mark, one of the things that I recommend for my clients is that they have kind of what I call a 5% swing for the fences fund, so if, if you really want to try and be that, that hedge fund trader or that, that private equity guy, then take 5% of your net worth and, and that's, your, that's your swing for the fences fund. And, and it sounds like a self-directed IRA is a great place 
to put your 5% swing for the fences fund because I also encourage people, instead of trying to pick the next Google, because I mean, God knows, you know, I, I can't tell of all the companies that are out there. Instead, you, you invest in your own company, you start up a side gig and you see where it goes. I mean, I, I, I built and sold a company with $400 worth of startup money, so it can be done. Yes. Now, one side note on that, Jason, everything you just said, I completely agree with. Um, and I love that little, you know, kind of uh, risky little swim for the fence money. I love it that you could use in a self-directed format. But be careful when you said the words, invest in my own business. Now, there are going to be some prohibited rules. Now, if you've got people bringing you projects, cherry pick one of those once in a while and put your IRA into that. That's great. But if you're trying to start your own new business or some sort of structure, uh, that your IRA is going to fund or 401k is going to fund. You have to be a little more cautious. That's where in a consult we're going to figure that out with you. The second thing is, but on a practical basis, is your brother brings you a new deal and says, hey, I'm opening up a little bodego down on the corner. I need an extra 50 grand to get this little deli off the, off the, off the ground. What do you think? And instead of putting your own 50 grand in it, maybe you peel out a little IRA money and do it. Could be completely tax free. So it's exciting. Yep. And uh, so an another thing that, that you mentioned, and, and I want to get back to this whole notion of, of starting your own business and kind of the tax consequences of that, because that's what your book really covers. Yes. But I, I, I have one more question about kind of what investors, what, what retail investors face. Um, so, and, and I know this is something that I deal with. So what are the tax differences between investing in mutual funds, index funds, actively managed, whatever, and individual stocks? You bet. Great question. From a tax perspective, there's not much. You're going to still be dealing with short-term capital gain or long-term capital gain. Where the, pro where the problem is <laughs> when you start playing with mutual funds or index funds compared to individual stocks in regards to taxation is really the reporting issues. Uh, the uh, IRS has, over the last two years, rolled out all sorts of regulations for especially the broker dealers out there regarding the 1099s, they're going to feel a lot thicker this spring when you get them in the mail, or they may even email them to you to save paper. So those 1099s are much more clear when you have a mutual fund, how you have basis for different stocks within the mutual fund. So what it means is your accountant has more work. And this is the truth, Jason. If you're going to be an aggressive day trader with mutual funds, your accountant's probably going to charge you more to do their tax return. Uh, because it's just going to take more work. The IRS is expecting uh, accountants to now show the, 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 the capital gain short term or long term by individual stock within a mutual fund on an individual's tax return and the, the reporting is crazy. That's a huge topic. CPAs are going to classes. I was in San Diego three weeks ago for a full day on this topic so I don't want to get too, uh, this is where your listeners will fall asleep. But, uh, but the point is if you're using mutual funds just know that your accountant may be sending you a little extra bill to deal with that on your tax return. Hey, and, and Mark, you know, that, what you're talking about brings up something that, that I think a lot of people don't understand, which is um, it's, it's quite possible to do your taxes for almost free. You, know, you, you can go to H&R Block and download Tax Cut or, or TurboTax or whatever, but Explain to me when and why I would want to go to a CPA to do my taxes as opposed to using TurboTax or something like that. Well, that's a great question, and that's probably maybe one of the list of mistakes that we could have kicked off with here on your this interview. The, the reality is um, if you just want to plug in your W-2, take your 1099 from stock trading, you give a little money to your church, throw the kids in there, plug it into TurboTax, you're screwed. There's nothing you can do. You're just going to pay. You've got a target on your back, and you're going to pay tax out the out the yin yang. So it, it's it's brutal. But if you want to be a little more uh, creative, and you want to be a little more planning oriented, you've got to give me something to work with. And this is where CPAs can really provide major value. So instead of just plugging it into Turbo and getting bent over, <laughs> sorry, you, why don't you talk with a CPA? that's a little more creative. Now what I talk about in my book and I consistently talk about with clients is why don't we add a small business aspect to your tax return? It gives me so much more to work with. Now maybe I will use a whiteboard for one second. Is that alright Jason? Absolutely. So just to visualize this, let's say um, your this is your basic tax return here. So here we go. We see that alright uh, Justin too? Okay. So you've got your basic tax return here and so here's your 1040. 
down here in the right hand corner, we're all familiar with this, is called AGI, Adjusted Gross Income. Now what millions of Americans do is they pay taxes, and they call this the line, they pay taxes, and then pay for stuff below the line. And you may have your stock brokerage income, your W-2, and maybe a little bit of retirement income, who knows? You've got this income up here, but you pay taxes and then pay for all sorts of things. Cell phone, travel, home office, dining, entertainment. Things that the entrepreneur can deduct above the line. Think of just a quick example as a cell phone. Maybe you're paying for your kid's cell phone, your spouse's cell phone, you've got data plans and all that, and your employer doesn't cut pick it up, but you're paying for it personally. That could be a couple hundred dollars a month. Well, multiply that by 12. Now we've got $2,400 that you're paying for this after tax. Which means you probably had to earn $3,600 in order to pay that $2,400 cell phone bill. That's a great point. And so now uh, there's no strategy. But if you have any sort of small business, Jason, like even a little rental property, maybe a little um, private equity project that you're involved in, or you're helping your brother invest in a deli down the street, or maybe you're doing a little consulting on the side, you're selling it, maybe you started a little MLM and you're selling Mona V or Amway. I don't care. Sell jeans on eBay to China, but give me something to work with. Because once you start any sort of little small business, and it doesn't have to rock your world, but any sort of small business, I can now write the cell phone off above the line. And when you start thinking about cell phone at two to three grand, a little bit of home office, a little bit of auto, some dining, some travel, some staples, Home Depot, supplies, equipment. I can write off an extra five to ten, maybe even fifteen thousand dollars a year of expenses that now allow you to generate fifteen thousand dollars of tax-free income with a little small business. So not only are you building wealth, we could be saving taxes at the same time. It's huge. And so many Americans are like, oh Mark, it's too risky to start a small business. It's too risky. I say it's too risky not to. Why don't I have something to fall back on, something to use for tax planning, and really trying to, to be more creative. And that's where a good CPA can change your life. And, and that's the difference between um, a CPA who is a strategic planner and me driving by the place that has the Statue of Liberty and the spinning sign where they're just going to plug and chug, same as doing tax cut. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and you know you bring this up in, in your book and, um, and I think you do an awesome job of covering it and so people it's worth investing you know the, the teens of how much it costs to buy this book to read it um, Thank so you. one of the things that you bring up is, is obviously starting a small business a side gig I'm very supportive of that I love entrepreneurship unfortunately the numbers um, of small businesses that, that fail are, are weighed against the entrepreneur. So it's 50% of small businesses are, are out of business in five years and by 15 years, 75% of them are out of business. So what happens and how do you uh, make sure that um, you are, again, laying the tax tail lag, a, a smart strategy for actually starting a side business? Well, well, you bet. First of all, don't be afraid to fail in a small business. Is it, that's not a big deal because guess what? Now I don't want you to throw thousands of dollars of capital at some invention that you're going to get, you know, mass produced in China and shipped in a container over here. You could ruin your life and go into bankruptcy. But why not start something small? A little service business, a little product business out of your home, a little something, a hobby that you've always enjoyed. But here's the point: take that small business and give it a shot. If you have losses the first couple of years. That's a write-off against your other income or saving taxes. Now there are hobby loss rules that by the third year we need to start showing profit. But if, if you don't, kill the business, start a different one. The hobby loss rules start over. So you can start another business and give it a shot. Guys, entrepreneurship is an art. It takes time and education. Kids don't learn this in high school. I didn't learn it in college. It's out there with the hard knocks, and, and this is why it takes the, a little bit of seminar, conference type attendance, reading blogs, getting involved in webinars. Jason, the information you give people gives them the, some of those practical tips to become a good entrepreneur. That's where we learn it is out on the streets. So anyway, Jason, I just tell people, 
go for it. Don't worry about some losses. We're going to take a tax write-off for it, start another business or another strategy two years from now. We'll start the clock ticking over on another hobby loss situation. And that's okay. Just think, if one of those irons in the fire gets hot and that business starts to take off, it could transform your life. Give you, at the very minimum, give you some extra income to cover that car payment or just make ends meet a little bit better or pay for some college education for your kids or a little bit of retirement that you don't have right now. Pay off some debt. Um, I love that. There you go. So, so I, I could just see the wheels spinning from someone who says, all right, what I'm going to do is start this small business and when my wife and I go to Disney World on vacation, uh, we're going we're gonna to sit in the restaurant and for five minutes say, hey, we're going to conquer the world by selling widgets and this is what we're going to do and they're going to try and write it off. Dispel that notion, please. Well, I don't know if I want to dispel that notion. I think that's an okay notion. Now, in my book, I talk about designing a business plan. I have, even have a table in the back to help you go through that process and great links to the Small Business Administration and their website. Um, designing a strategic plan so that you're not running around with your head cut off and, and also designing a marketing plan. I call those the, the trifecta of a small business ownership success plan. You need to have a business plan, a strategic plan, a marketing plan and make it work together. Now, if you're at dinner and you've got a great idea, cultivate it. Play with it. Invest a little money into it. Give it some time. Turn off the TV at night. Stay up an extra hour. Talk about that business plan. On Saturday, carve out a little time in the morning. I think it's a great idea to get excited about it and go for it. And I have clients that come up with the craziest ideas that come to our office every year. We set up hundreds of entities every year for clients around the country. And some, it's Jason, it'll blow your mind. I have people come in with ideas that I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so awesome. How can I be involved? <laughs> you know. And then I have another client that comes in with the stupidest idea, and I'm like, good luck. And then who, you know, then what happens six months from now? The guy with the weird idea is making money hand over fist, and this other traditional idea is like, oh, he's still struggling. It just, you never know. And you know what, guys? Live the dream. You only live once, and you live in the greatest country in the world that actually motivates us to do this. Why not? So, so Mark, what, one of the things that you um, advocate in your book is that everyone should own a rental property. And, and ideally, you buy a rental property a year, and pretty soon you have 10 of them. So if, if I kind of do that reductio ad absurdum, uh, no one owns a house that they live in, everyone owns rental properties. But I, I don't think that that's actually going to be the case because I don't think pe there are enough people that A, know about it, and B, have the wherewithal to do it. So explain why owning a rental property is good for, for a mom and pop investor or, or ordinary Joes like you and I. Well, you bet. Let me go back to the whiteboard for this, folks. Now, uh, uh, the, and, and let me give it a little bit of framework here. When I have a new client come to my office, I divide their lives into two sides. I put over on one side their operations. This is kind of their ordinary income. Then, on the other side, I put their investments. And this could be the passive income, for lack of a better word. So we want to create this wall. Now for asset protection purposes, we want to avoid a lawsuit, we want to protect our assets, which is a common theme in this whole process. But over here, you might have a W-2, your spouse might have a W-2, could have a couple jobs going on. You may start a small business as a sole proprietor, some of you might have an S corporation. But what's going on here is you're generating income. This is what's paying the monthly nut, right? We're trying to create enough income so we don't have to kill ourselves. And when we get a little profit, we bring it across the wall and put it on our investment side. Now, where do we put it in? Well, we could create a little 401k for our small business. We may be funding an IRA. We may be funding a 401k at our day job. And we can have both going on, frankly, which is exciting. We might be self-directing a portion of this. We may just be doing traditional investing. But here's the point. There's limits on your contributions, right? And if you start making more money, we want to be a little more creative. And so I love to set up the LLC and start using this for rental property. And I suggest to my clients maybe just buying one rental a year. One rental a year can be really, really powerful to create wealth. Now here's the reason why. So this is the structure, Jason. Thanks for your patience. And so we're building up 
investment assets. We're building up rental properties. Uh, we may be uh, putting together our own investment funds that are outside of our IRA. That's great. But here's why I love real estate. On paper, real estate will lose money. On paper. Because of depreciation and mortgage interest. You get to write off so much of the expenses that your tenant is paying for you. Then you can create cash flow with a rental and a tax-free appreciation. So not only you're getting ta cash flow that's tax-free, you're building appreciation that you may never pay tax on. You could do 1031 exchanges, charitable remainder trusts, hold that property and live off the rental income someday, but you're also getting the tax benefits. Tax benefits, cash flow, and appreciation. And all I'm saying is, folks, I'm not, I'm not saying everybody has to become a real estate tycoon like Donald Trump. I'm just saying buy one little cute rental a year. The last rental I bought was a $19,000 foreclosed single family condo, one bedroom, one bath in Phoenix. I bought it two years ago. And I actually bought another property since because I buy my one property a year. But that was the last little individual rental I bought. $19,000. It rents for $550 a month. My property taxes are $600 a year. That's $50 a month. And my property manager is $50 a month, 10% of the rents. I cash flow $450 a month on a $19,000 investment. Within three years, I've got my money back. That's crazy. In rental real estate, you don't have to be rich to do it. Just get some education on it. Be open to it. Don't shun it like it's a, a fringe strategy and only the crazies out there are trying to buy properties with no money down. It works. I have dentists, doctors, corporate CEOs buying real estate on the weekends and they don't tell their friends because they're embarrassed about it. And I don't know why. It's amazing. Hey, and, and I do it too. I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an owner of rental real estate and uh, it, it's, uh, it, it is a great part of a, of a well-defined portfolio strategy. Well-diversed. Well-diversed yep. plan. Yeah, yep. I love it. Very good. All right, Mark, this has been awesome. So how can people get in touch with you? I mean, you've, you've gotten everyone jacked up about, about taking advantage of being smart uh, with their taxes. How can they get in touch with you? Well, thank you. Now, uh, ironically, for those that are listening live right now uh, on January 31st, um, just write this down. Don't go to your computer yet. With the GoDaddy hack that happened earlier this week that you heard about in the news, our websites have been affected and we're still down. We're trying to fix this. <laughs> but by the weekend, hopefully it'll be there. So write down my website, check it out, and you've got to stay in touch with me. It's www.markjkohler.com. Mark, J as in Jolly, Kohler, K-O-H-L-E-R.com. I'm sure it'll be printed up there on YouTube for you. But go check that out when you have a minute. I've got online videos. You can sign up for my weekly free newsletter. I've got a webinar series every spring and fall that's very, very affordable for entrepreneurs to learn all these strategies. Uh, you can pick up my two books. Go to Amazon, pick up them. Guys, you just Google my name, you'll see me. So uh, it's awesome. I think there's a Mark J. Kohler that's a wildlife artist out of Texas that draws deer and paintings. That's not me. I'm more of the tax guy. <laughs> And you also have a Facebook page as well, right? Oh my gosh, Facebook, LinkedIn. I'm out there, folks. You'll Twitter. find me. Yeah, Twitter. And I'm constantly writing um, for entrepreneur. But if you get uh, on my uh, uh, website, you'll get links to the law firm and the accounting firm. We'd love to help set up your entity. We have a service cheaper than LegalZoom where you get law firm quality with a paralegal support entity cheaper than LegalZoom. We have full service entities for under $1,000 to help clients. And we give you unlimited consulting with the attorney during that setup. We have tax returns that we do for clients all over the country. Folks, if you're not getting some love in this area, if you're just dropping off your tax return at a, a, you know, a little corner shop and then going and getting a coffee and picking it up, you're, you're, you're leaving money on the table. There are strategies out there that can rock your world. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I admit, I wish uh, I had, had known some of these strategies when I started my old company that I sold because I imagine... Uh, we wouldn't have paid nearly as much in self-employment tax. That was, to me, that was the big, the big aha moment of reading your book was all the things you could do to reduce the self-employment tax and to make sure that you're sheltering your income. It, it's, it's an awesome book, and uh, I, I hope my readers go out and, uh, and buy it. So Mark Kohler, uh, links will be, uh, uh, links will be available on the YouTube uh, posting as well as on my post. I imagine you'll be blogging about this as well. So thank you very much for joining us today. Again, www.markjkohler.com. 
Mark, thanks a ton for joining us. Jason, thank you, and uh, have an awesome 2013. Thanks.